Mary had a little man, man, man. The fall. We believe that all men are created to the magnificent mosaic that is America. A radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Help is on the way. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Roach Show. Turn up your mind. Two members of the Tennessee Three have officially won their re-election. Tennessee oh. State House Democrats Justin Jones, Justin Pearson, and Gloria Johnson interrupted House proceedings for a gun control protest back in April. Republicans voted to expel Jones and Pearson, who were both black, but not Johnson, who was white, sparking nationwide controversy. Mm. Jones and Pearson were both quickly reappointed to their seats, and now they've won Thursday's special elections. They will retain their seats for the remainder of their two-year term. And then they're going to have to do it all over again. Yay! Yay to the Justins! Very happy for you. You know, not only did they have to get reelected yesterday, but they had to actually run through a primary, too, and then uh, face an election in the middle of the uh, hot, steamy August where our Congress, uh, you know, the federal, uh, they're in recess. They're on vacation. And they had to appear on the back. See, this is what's going to happen all over the country. Uh, there are no off, off months anymore. There's no more off years anymore. There's no more vacay uh, for voters anymore. You always, always have to be on that wall. You always have to be, like, observant and alert and ready to vote at a moment's notice, which means you need to be registered at all times. Now, in this here country, you don't need to be registered for any damn, uh, you know, assault weapon, hardly ever. But you do need to be registered to vote, which is speech, but not if you're the Justins. Then if you're the Justins and you go to the House floor in Tennessee and you are asking for, you know, a legitimate, you know, uh, inkling, a clue that you might have a regulation on getting access to a semi-automatic uh, weapon after a school shooting... Yeah, a school shooting, which is why they were, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the floor. But, uh, you know, if you do that, that's called an insurrection. Do you know that? The guy, Cameron Sexton, what a name, what a name, what a name. Boy, you Southern people, you sure know how to pick them, okay? But uh, Cameron Sexton, he, was, he is the uh, Republican Speaker of the House. He is the man, the, the sole, uh, you know, uh, uh, person who decided that the Justins had to go, that they had violated decorum. Decorum. Decorum because he turned their microphones off. Does everybody remember what happened here? Just uh, need to refresh. Uh, that they, he turned their microphones off, and then they used a small portable bullhorn in order to talk to the gallery, in order to talk to the people who came to support them in their efforts to get some common sense gun legislation in the great state of Tennessee. Beautiful state, horrible government. Governance, just like almost the worst, almost the worst. I'm about to show you the worst. I'm, I'm going to do it. I know it's Friday. I would like to uh, give you good news. You know, I did tell you Taylor Swift gave uh, her truck drivers, each of her 50, 50 truck drivers, she gave each of them a $100,000 bonus. And I didn't pay Brett today. What? Huh? I know I didn't even pay you today. I forgot. I, I forgot to pay Sean too. I got to do it. Uh, but it's not that I can't, and it's not that I won't. What I can't do is tip you out a hundred grand, which would be like I would feel so great if I could do that. Can you imagine being in a position to do that? And that's what Taylor Swift is in a position to do. And guess what? That is what she did. I mean, that is just a beautiful, beautiful thing. Like, I will buy tickets. Well, you know, she could have given them tickets to the show, and then they could have sold them, and she, they would have gotten more than a hundred grand. Just saying. But she's anti-scalping. Good for her. <laughs> she's a very, uh, you know, conscious person. But I, I would like to tell you more of that kind of news. Except I can't. I can't. Uh, you know, I can start with this, that the Justins, uh, you know, defeated opponents, both in primaries and and in the general, and they will go back to their seats, but that the Speaker of the Republican House in Tennessee actually characterized uh, their advocacy for the people of Memphis, who obviously they still enjoy a lot of support from because they were just reelected, and the people of Nashville similarly support Justin Jones, uh, they would like to see some common sense gun legislation. They would like to see that. And so I would like to start with that as, you know, like a, a good thing, a good thing. 
But then we have to talk about Mississippi, which is also backwards, which is so backwards, which is so painfully backwards. You know, I used to tell that story all the time about how I was run out of Mississippi by the Klan. I'm not even going to bother with that because, you know what, reading this, I started to cry. You know why? I know that this happens. And number two, it hasn't changed a bit. It hasn't changed a bit in 30 years. You know, I was really young when that happened to me, like really stupid and young, like fearlessly young, you know, like uh, nothing was ever going to happen to me young, right? And so when these guys said they had never seen a Jew before, (laughs) I said, well— you know, uh, I'm a Jew. And they said, well, we heard you have horns. And I said, you know, yeah, but we keep them in during the day. And I let them feel my horn. Hence the, uh, you know, clan shows up at my door. But it's still going on. It's still happening there in Mississippi. So this is what I have to tell you, okay? I have to. In Mississippi, there was a case that just came to a conclusion, a, just, a justice, uh, a justifiable uh, well, I guess I could characterize the conclusion as good. Because six police officers, six white police officers, you know where this is going. That's all you have to say in this country. Six white police officers. Everybody knows where the story's going. Now, why would that be? Because it's constant, okay? Because everybody knows this is what goes on. That's why. You almost don't need to say another word. However, Six white police officers were called by a white woman, a white woman, a neighbor, who said two black guys were living in this other white woman's house and the police needed to come and check on the white woman and make sure that these two black guys weren't doing something bad to her. Turns out these two black guys were friends of hers who were taking care of her while she was unable to care for herself. She was ill and they came to cook for her, to clean for her, to do her laundry. Disgusting. This story gets so bad. I'm going to try not to cry because this is really ugly. Okay, so the white woman calls the cops. Cops come at six at a time. Okay, six at a time. They come in. uh, They don't have a warrant. And they they say, oh, you know, there's, uh, you know, like a ring doorbell, surveillance cameras, whatever. Uh, So if we go in this way, the cameras won't see us. If If we enter over here, the cameras won't see us. So let's do that. Because we don't have a warrant, okay? And they, they actually agree to do that, that, that sneaky little thing because they don't have a warrant. So they enter anyway, okay? Guns are blazing. And um, for 90 minutes, for 90 minutes, they terrorize these two men. They terrorize them. I mean, like every way that you could possibly imagine. You understand what I'm saying to you? Like if I tell you um, you have to envision Butch and Marcellus in Pulp Fiction, in the Gimp Room, okay, do you know what I'm saying? This goes on for 90 freaking minutes. They use racist slurs. They tell them that to get out of Rankin County. And the second I hear that, because that's what I was told, get out of Tishomingo County, okay? They tell them to get out of Rankin County, go back to Jackson, go back to their side of the Pearl River, uh, which is where a higher concentration of African Americans live in Mississippi. Okay, black residents uh, live on that side of the Pearl River. Uh, and then one of the police officers shoves a gun into Mr. Jenkins' mouth, one of the black men who went to take care of his friend, and fired. Literally fired. But did he kill him? No. Just lacerated his tongue and broke his jaw. The bullet exited this guy's neck. Okay? And remember, they're in there without a warrant. And they actually have a conversation, these six officers do, about don't leave any visible injuries. Guess that didn't work out, according to plan. Don't leave any visible injuries. We don't want any, quote, bad mug shots. Swear to God. Then they threw eggs on the victims that had already been handcuffed. They forced them to lie on their backs. They poured milk, alcohol, and chocolate syrup down their mouths, down their throats. Then they forced them to strip naked and shower to remove the evidence of the syrup, the alcohol, and the milk. They repeatedly electrocuted them with their stun guns to compare which sheriff's department or police department's weapons uh, were more powerful. And then they found some sex toys in the house. And they abused them with the toys for an hour and a half. Things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. 
The six law enforcement officers in the Michael Jenkins and Eddie Parker abuse case appeared in federal court, and there they pleaded guilty Yay. to a wide range of serious crimes. The U.S. Justice Department unveiled civil rights charges against the six men today. According to federal prosecutors, the defendants referred to themselves as the goon squad because of their willingness to use excessive force and not to report it. Those charged in the case are former Rankin County deputies Christian Dedman, Hunter Elward, Brett McAlpin, Jeffrey Middleton, and Daniel Opdyke, as well as former Richland police officer Joshua Hartfield. Hartfield was off duty during the January raid on the house in Braxton. Court documents show the officers went there because a neighbor had complained that black people were staying with the white woman who owned the house. You thought I was being dramatic, didn't you? You thought I was embellishing. You thought I was adding to the uh, disgusting nature of this uh, particular crime committed by six police officers, six white police officers. No, I wasn't. And in fact, uh, they did plead guilty. And now uh, this is why it's it's got, you know, I don't want to say a happy ending, but this is why it has a just a justiciable, you know, like a, a sort of a, a flavor, a tinge of justice associated with it. That it happened and that it continues to happen. In states like Alabama, Mississippi, in states like Tennessee, okay, where, where, where there's still so much hatred and misunderstanding and distrust and, and, and dehumanization of other humans, uh, it, it, it just it takes your breath away. It makes you weep for this nation because Trump didn't start this. Trump didn't cause this. Trump, he just simply exposed it and gave permission for it to be acceptable that there should be no shame around it. That's what Trump did. He didn't break us. He showed us how broken we really were. Now we have to freaking fix it, okay? And so I just wanted to show you this, uh, this particular story and, and, and tie it to something that's current, right? Something you could do. Because everybody's like, what can we do? What can we do? I know what you can do. In Mississippi on Tuesday, this is another way that the Republicans get over on you. On Tuesday in August, August 8th, Mississippi, you have to vote. You have to vote for your uh, new, uh, uh, I think, uh, your lieutenant governor. You have to pick a lieutenant governor in the middle of August in Mississippi. Who knew? Well, now you do if you're there. Uh, also, the 5th Judicial District District Attorney. Now, right now, the reason why that doesn't sound like anything you would recall, but if I tell you this, you will, the current district attorney, uh, is a guy by the name of Doug Evans, okay? You know, he is known best for trying a black Mississippian named Curtis Flowers six times for the same crime. Do you remember Curtis Flowers? Does anybody remember? Google him, okay? Refresh yourself. Because this district attorney, Doug Evans, kept on trying Curtis Flowers over and over and over and over again for the same crime, and he didn't do it. He didn't do it. Well, he just retired last month. And this man ran the district attorney's office, which we now know has a lot of uh, uh, autonomy and authority over the people that live in his district, right? DAs can charge people. DAs can convene grand juries. DAs can charge RICO violations. Isn't this what you're so upset about in Georgia, that Fonnie Willis is a district attorney in Fulton County? Isn't this what you're so upset about, that she could convene a grand jury? Now, the first special grand jury she convened did not have the authority to indict people. She had to actually use a grand jury to get the authority to have another grand jury in order to indict people. Well, in Mississippi, it don't work like, like that, okay? This guy had so much autonomy and so little oversight that he was able to try one man and just harass him his entire life. Uh, for the same crime over and over and over again, okay? So now all of a sudden, uh, one of his deputies is trying to replace him, and they've been loyal to him, and uh, not much will change. So you have a choice to make. It's a primary uh, in the 5th Judicial, judicial District in uh, Mississippi, the 11th Judicial District in Mississippi. Uh, that's a very rural district in northwest Mississippi, um, there's a very uh, uh, a rare contested district attorney race in your state. Michael Carr, who is a defense attorney, is challenging the incumbent, Brenda Mitchell. Now, what's important to know here is Brenda Mitchell, who is currently the district attorney in this rural 
district, this rural county in northwestern Mississippi, has has pledged not to not to prosecute abortion cases. So this guy is challenging her because he wants to prosecute women who have abortions. Swear to God. And so every time you you walk up against, you know, a a topic or or something that you're like, oh, my God, this is minority rule. And how did this happen? I'm showing you that they are having not only gerrymandering maps and not only, you know, uh, removing people's right to speak and have it matter with the gerrymanders. Right. Which have been challenged by courts in Alabama, North Carolina this year, New York, even, Uh, you know, all these uh, illegal gerrymanders are finally being called out for what they are. And that's silencing people's right to, uh, you know, speak through their vote. But now, uh, you know, I'm trying to show you that they move these elections to the dead of summer in an off year and say, OK, you're going to have to live with this district attorney. You're going to have to live with this lieutenant governor. You're going to have to live with that, you know. And uh, also in, in DeSoto County in Mississippi, that's one of the most populous counties in the entire state. You have to pick your sheriff, your county sheriff. Uh, it is a GOP primary. OK, so there's really like no great choices there. But uh, and both candidates rhetoric on crime is, uh, you know, like, hey, we're going uh, to one of the candidates sent a mailer that has a picture of the SWAT team. This is like this. So Uvalde, OK, uh, a SWAT team overlaid with the words, if you commit a crime in DeSoto County, we don't believe in doorbells. Well, I'm showing you why they need to believe in doorbells with this story that I just told you about this warrantless entry into a white woman's house because the neighbor said there's two black guys in there and you need to come and check and for 90 minutes they hold this guy hostage 90 minutes you know how long that is to be tortured by six police officers as two terrified black men who just came to help their friend out when she was ill to cook for her to clean for her to help her get around Oh, my God. And they, they abuse these guys with sex toys and stun guns and mock, ex, mock uh, executions, which goes awry. This is the word. It goes awry. And the guy gets shot in the mouth. So I just want you to know that you have an opportunity on Tuesday, Mississippi, to choose the lesser of two evils in some of these primaries, Okay. But uh, this is the U.S. District Judge Tom Lee. He said these men who did this thing to uh, these two uh, men, these two black guys, uh, Deadman and Ed- Elward, I swear to God, sounds like the Blues Brothers. You can't make these names up. They each face a maximum sentence of 120 years plus life in prison, $2.7 million in fines, Hartfield, uh, 80 years possibly, and a $1.5 million fine. Mr. McAlpin faces 90 years in prison and a $1.75 million fine. Mr. Middleton is looking at 80 years and a $1.5 million. And Mr. Updike could be sentenced to 100 years in prison and a $2 million fine. You have to go to a U.S. district judge in order to get anything that resembles, you know, justice in this state of Mississippi. Don't look to your, uh, you know, district attorney and don't look to your sheriffs. And that's why I'm telling you, you have you have elections on Tuesday, Mississippi. Lynn Connect. To speak to Randy, call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. Elections matter. I am grateful to the people of District 86 for going to the polls, for showing up in early voting, for showing up at the polls to make sure that we restore representation that was unjustly taken by the Tennessee Republican supermajority who abuse power and who are more focused on changing our democracy to their own mobocracy. Uh, Our politics is not one uh, that is confrontational for those who want justice. Uh, for people who want to see those who've been pushed to the periphery and the margins elevated, for people who want to see an end of poverty, for, for people who want to see an end of gun violence, it's not confrontational. It's one that says we have to center the folks who have been kicked out of the conversation for mm. far too long. What is uh, uh, what we are seeing as confrontational or being seen as confrontational is running up against a status quo that doesn't want to change. And there are people in the Republican Party who have built their entire careers on how they can oppress people. How can they oppress black folk and queer folk and poor folk? How can they oppress people? And when you have a a district that is saying no more, uh, we've had enough of that. We've had enough of being told that we're the paths of least resistance. We've had enough of being told our air quality doesn't matter. We've had enough of being told that our children don't matter. We've had mm. enough of that. They say, well, you're just being too confrontational. <laughs> but when we weren't being confrontational, what, how did that serve us? 
How have you served us? Mm -hmm. And they haven't. No, and they never will. You have to, you know, actually speak up. And here's the little trick, okay? Get on the TV. Swear to God. You have to get on the TV. Do you think that we would have known about Justin Pearson or Gloria Johnson or Justin Jones? Do you think we would have known anything about what went on, uh, you know, in in, in, uh, legislatures all over this country? If it wasn't for the TV, we wouldn't know anything. We wouldn't know jack crap about what happened in uh, Tennessee to these uh, to these uh, fine, fine represent uh, representatives who do a great job, an absolutely great, tireless just constant, constant, you know, uh, 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 nonviolent protest to try and get the majority's view to be heard in the Tennessee legislature. That's all they were doing. That's all they were doing. They had their mics turned off and then they were expelled, expelled for their free speech, expelled uh, because, uh, you know, one man could do it because one Republican who was Speaker of the House could do it. Uh, I mean, it's just so unbelievable. But they got on the TV. They got on the television. And that, you know what else, uh, you know, got done because of the television? Uh, Derek Chauvin got convicted because of the television. Derek Chauvin and his arrogant hand in his pocket stare down that was recorded on someone's damn cell phone, thank God, uh, and was broadcast on the TV, on the TV, actually allowed for Minnesota to waive, because usually Minnesota doesn't allow cameras in the courtroom for criminal trials. But the judge in the Derek Chauvin uh, case understood, understood that the people of this country, after the George Floyd protests, needed to see and needed to be reassured and assured, those that didn't believe it in the, you know, going in, that justice could be done and what it looked like, sounded like, what uh, evidence uh, would, would be and how you know, testimony goes and, and how the rule of law actually works in courtrooms. And so the judge in the Chauvin case allowed for cameras to be in a criminal trial courtroom. And because of that decision, America got to watch and everybody was kind of okay with the verdict when Derek Chauvin was convicted of murdering George Floyd. Now, if it wasn't on the TV, I don't know that everybody would have been okay. I don't know that people, you know, you would be listening to, uh, you know, secondhand accounts and reading cold transcripts where you didn't get to see you know, uh, any of the expert testimony where you didn't get to see the videos that were shown, where you didn't get to see his parents, right? Where you didn't get to see his 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 wife, you didn't get to see his friends uh, testify. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, that was a smart decision, and now we need that decision again. We need that decision with regard to Donald Trump's trial. We absolutely positively have got to get cameras in the federal criminal courtroom. And, uh, you know, there are some ideas about how to go about doing that. I keep on looking for smart people to help me figure out what the right road to go down to get the cameras in the courtroom might be. What is the, you know, what does the street sign say that I have to follow? And apparently there is, uh, and, and I know this because of, you know, my boyfriend in heaven here, Sheldon Whitehouse, who told us that the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of the United States, controls the, um, the rules of the courts. And the rule that is barring, banning cameras from the federal criminal courtrooms or the federal courtrooms at all, even the Supreme Court, is a rule called Rule 53, it doesn't matter, but that the, uh, the enforcer of the rules in the federal courts is the Supreme Court. It is a, um, a, a, a judicial uh, convention uh, and it's headed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Roberts. And if you go to them and you ask them to waive the rule in this own, just for this case or to change the rule, now this rule, Rule 53, was adopted, wait for it, in 1946. 1946. Do you, know, do you know the infancy of television in 1946? We are now a social media country, okay? And, and the idea that we can't, even have a camera in the courtroom because of something that was decided in night. No broadcast. It was about radio, actually. It was about radio in 1946. The word is broadcast that's in there. Uh, it's, it's so, it's, it's unconscionable. So Rule 53 was, uh, you know, and, and in this digital age where this will be one of the most important trials in the history of this nation, I mean, 
the legal uh, scholars that I've spoken to, the constitutional ones, the people who study, you know, uh, major turning points in American history v- by virtue of the law flipping or the law acknowledging or the law catching up to uh, the majority of the American people, cases like Dred Scott, right? Cases like um, Brown versus Board of Education. Cases like uh, Marbury versus Madison, which gave the court its authority, okay? Uh, These are pivotal bedrock uh, cases of America's advancement into a more civilized society, a more, I hate to say it because it's so trite and it's so cliche, a more perfect union, right? But this case, United States v. Trump, is going to be up there in importance with these cases. And the idea that Americans might not be able to see that justice is being done or that justice isn't being done, that, that Americans need to and, and want to and have to see what goes on in this particular courtroom and that we could be kept out of the conversation and that the only way we can have the conversation is going to be based on secondhand accounts or is going to be based on reading daily cold transcripts of what went, you know, we were not going to be able to see anybody's, you know. Uh, uh. So, you know, like, for instance, uh, if we had to do it in, let's say, the um, Derek Chauvin case, OK, we would be reading transcripts to you all day saying uh, and then Derek Chauvin uh, arrogantly looked into the camera. I mean, how how can you convey that look, that expression with his knee on that man's neck, okay, for almost 10 minutes, for nine minutes. How could you convey that in a cold trance? You can't, okay? Same thing with Kyle Rittenhouse. What was I going to do? Tell you. And then Kyle Rittenhouse cried. You know what I mean? Like, how are you going to be able to judge for yourself if that was an authentic, uh, you know, like, ugly cry or if it was a cry for help cry? Right? Like, I don't want to go to jail. Okay, that's why there's cameras. Clear for takeoff. This is the Randy Rhodes Show. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. All right. Rhonda and Erie, hello. How are you? I'm good. I thought of you yesterday, actually. So I'm so glad you called. I am, and I, I called because uh, I am driving backwards in time through Mississippi right now as we speak. So, so when you started talking about the case, you know, I was like, she's listening to me. We're psychically connected. <laughs> um, I, I, I think the thing that, that's important about all of this, not just that case, but what's happening in Mississippi writ large, and, and then not just Mississippi, it's happening in Oklahoma, um, where the governor just, uh, you know, wrote a resolution giving us a definition of what a woman is. All of these things have their precedent in history. All we're doing is seeing um, white men in power try to take us backwards because all of the, you know, the, um, the troublesome groups now have gotten access to rights and power and we've all gotten up at it, right? Yeah. And so all we're seeing are the same tactics that they used to oppress us historically being revisited. This is no different than what we saw um, you know, in the thirties and the forties and the fifties and the sixties. It's the same. And I really want people to start paying more attention to the fact that we have seen this before so that we can start creating um, solutions and um, and activism that works against it. Because people keep being shocked by this. I'm like, why are you shocked? I don't know. This has happened before. Yeah, it has happened before. But, you know, a lot of us never had to have our noses rubbed in it. You know what I'm saying? A lot of us, uh, you know, have had, yeah. you know, a, a, a separation between us and the history that is so ugly. A lot of us have had separation between, uh, you know, us and people suffering. We haven't had to see it. We haven't had to smell it. Yeah. We haven't had to, you know, uh, fix yeah. it. And so that's why people are so lost about what to do when it actually 
uh, you know, is in your neck of the woods when it's actually right in front of you. People are like, wait, 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 what yeah. do I do? What do I do? Because we've never had to. But people who That's think, true. yeah, and people who think that Donald Trump isn't interested in going back to the 40s or going back to the 30s, and by that I mean like the 1840s and the 1830s, uh, yes. right? Yeah. They, 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 they think that, uh, you know, he, he loves them. <laughs> he thinks that, you know, they, they think that that's why he's, uh, you know, doing what he does. That's why he's defying the law. That's why he betrays us. That's why he, you know, uh, encourages open uh, mor- moral filth, basically, you know, and says there are good people on both sides and things like he excuses like this ugly behavior because his goal is to take you backwards. And there are some people who want to oh, go there. <laughs> so it's, it's like I well, said, he didn't I mean, break he, us. He's just showing us how broken we were. Exactly. And, and you know how, you know, folks who are always like, and I'm sorry if you can hear the road noise, if it gets too loud, just feel free to dump me. But <laughs> um, the, the, the thing that, that always gets me is that um, people don't understand that really what he's trying to do is take us back to that time when, he, when people like him had absolutely no repercussions for what they did. In fact, they would get a pat on the back. Those police officers really thought that they were going to get a pat on the back for torturing those men. Right. They did because 50 years ago, they would have. They would have gotten a pat on the back. People would have said, well done. You know, for keeping these these um, potential criminals. You know what they would have said? They would have. They, they would have said what Tommy Tuberville says. They would have put his arm around them and yes. said, "You're you're a real American." Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right. Well, listen, you drive safe, and thank you so much yeah. for calling me. I was talking to uh, Gary from Fort Lauderdale yesterday, and he was bringing up how grateful he was to black women. And I, I said, yeah, listen, I, I'm very lucky to know Rhonda and Erie, who's guided me through a lot of these difficult <laughs> things, you know. So thank you for calling me today. You I appreciate it. Me. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> be, be safe. Uh, Norman in Illinois. Hey, how you doing, Randy? I'm good. Mm-hmm. Listen, I live in Woodstock, Illinois, and we have a um, an area in our downtown off our town square that was set up for restaurants to have al fresco service and all that. They could serve beer and wine. Mm-hmm. We had two incidents here, one around the 4th of July and then after. And um, it... it, it yes. I think his line's going in and out. Might want to dump him out. I think. I mean, okay. he had a grad. He had a great point about gun violence reaching his suburbs. But Lee yeah. in Ohio. Yes. How are you doing? Okay. You got an election on Tuesday. You know that, right? Election on Tuesday. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You gonna vote? Uh, no, I ain't. No. What county no. are you in? Uh, Miami County. Okay. Yes, and how may I help you? But I, I was just saying, you know, you know, uh, I just think they're all after Trump, you know, just trying to keep him out of office. Uh, you look at Biden on TV, and he deals with all these, you know, all these other people in other countries, and he, you know, he can't even talk to them. Sits there and falls asleep. You know, and I, and I think they're just trying to put him, Donald Trump, in jail just to keep. Have you have you ever liked win. any Democratic president? Like when Bill Clinton was president, did you yeah, like did you call yeah, them? Did, like did you say that you know he he and Hillary were like uh, murdering people and stuff, or were you well, were you good with it? Well, well, I know, cause I, 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 I know how you do. I know how you do, and so uh, you know, I know that you're uh, you're not being. No, I don't. I don't believe that they went around killing people. Or had people. No, you don't. You know, I don't believe that. I, I ain't into that conspiracy stuff. No. But uh, so, who killed you know, Vince Foster? <laughs> who killed Vince Foster? Uh huh. I don't know. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I don't. Uh-huh. I mean, I, I don't know a lot. Of All that. right, so a what? what is your issue with Joe Biden? I'm sorry, what is the issue with him? Because this is, uh, you know, the economy is, uh, you know, having the best uh, result that it could have had after COVID. 
uh, you know, people are, are situated uh, well for, you know, non-college, uh, you know, good paying $40 an hour, $50 an hour jobs. He's invested yeah. in the Rust Belt, which is where you're from. Uh, and uh -huh. factories are being built. Infrastructure is being repaired. Uh, the economy is in like really good shape. Wages are up. Inflation is down. So what is your beef with him that you don't like the way he presents on the TV? No, no, you know, and he's after, yeah, he's trying to push all this, uh, that green deal. Uh, yeah, that's called the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. That That is building, uh, you know, electric charging stations along your highways there. That's actually well, building the factories, the, the chips factories. The, yes, I mean, your, your guy uh, threatened, uh, you know, China a million ways to Sunday. Your guy had to buy out the farmers, had to send them, you know, subsidies, had to send them, uh, you know, grants, government money because he broke up their markets that they spent their lives building over there in China because, you know, he wanted to appear tough on China. In, the, in Joe Biden's world, the way that you appear tough on China is you challenge them on the, the chips business, the semiconductor business, and you start your own here and make what they have worthless. Which way would you like to go? Well, we should have never, we should have never, uh, we should have been building chips here in the beginning. Yeah, but we, we weren't, we but, we were, but we weren't, but yeah, we weren't, no, we weren't. We weren't. Okay, because all right, all right. Anyway, there are two ways to, uh, you know, skin that cat. And one is uh, to continue to offshore our jobs, right? Uh, one, uh, one way is to actually do nothing in response to, uh, you know, China's prowess in the EV, the electric vehicle market or the battery market or the semiconductor market or any of the emerging green energy markets where, you know, obviously, uh, you know, somebody's going to dominate the multi-trillion dollar marketplace of green solutions to fossil fuels because fossil fuels are you know, I hate to tell you, they're over. You live in Ohio. You know that there's, you know, the, you, you've even sheared off your mountaintops trying to find the last bits of coal. And now, with global warming, you got no mountaintops. <laughs> it's just going to flood out. Anyway, it's a multi-trillion dollar marketplace. You could either scream and yell about it and threaten about it and, uh, you know, tweet about it. Or you can actually compete. You can actually create the market yourself. You can create the wind turbine market. You can build the turbines. You can use American bearings in the turbines. You can use American workers to build, install, service the turbines and make 50 bucks an hour doing it. Or you could tweet about it. <laughs> I just asked you a simple question like, which way would you like to go? And you're like, well, we should have been doing it here all along. Yeah, well, we weren't. So which way would you like to go? You know what I'm saying? There are some people in this country that just cannot look forward. They just can't. It's it's like, what about is it? But we should have been, and we could have been, and we would have been. I don't know. Radio Beacon to Radio Beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Help is on the way. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey! It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Road Show. Turn up your mind. President Donald Trump in federal court just blocks from the U.S. Capitol, attacked by some of his supporters on January 6th. Mr. Trump pleading not guilty to four felony charges, stemming from what prosecutors say was a criminal scheme to overturn the 2020 election, including conspiracy to defraud the United States. Following his arraignment, the 2024 Republican frontrunner claimed the charges against him are designed to damage his campaign. This is a persecution of a political opponent. This was never supposed to happen in America. But for the most part, the former president was treated like any other criminal defendant. Huh. He was processed and fingerprinted, but no mugshot was taken. Inside the courtroom, Mr. Trump and his attorneys sat just steps away from special counsel Jack Smith. Jeez. He was released on the condition he not communicate with witnesses about the case unless attorneys are present. The judge also warning Mr. Trump that it would be a crime to influence the jury what? and to threaten or retaliate against witnesses or what? any other person who may have information about the case. What? The judge adding, quote, if you fail to comply with any of the conditions of your release, a warrant may be issued for your arrest. That somewhat unusual warning notable because of Mr. Trump's history of verbally attacking witnesses, prosecutors and judges involved in other criminal and civil proceedings he's faced. Deranged Jack Smith and the DOJ 
will probably bring another case. Mr. Trump's attorneys say they'll fight against a speedy trial. This is a fast-moving railroad without any concern for justice. Despite his dominance in the 2024 Republican primary, the former president is facing at least three trials in the coming year, including in the Mar-a-Lago classified documents case. Aid Walt Nauta, his co-defendant in that case, at his side yesterday in Washington, with a possible fourth indictment looming in Georgia this month, where the Fulton County DA is investigating Mr. Trump's alleged attempts to overturn President Biden's 2020 victory in that state. Hmm. The next hearing in this case will come on August 28th, at which point the judge hopes to set a trial date. Prosecutors say they want to move quickly. Mr. Trump's defense team signaling they'll push for a delay. Of course, because that's all Trump knows how to do. Trump has two things that he does, and, you know, we'll say it till, uh, you know, we're done with this trial. One is, I'm the victim. I'm the victim. This is my lawlessness and my hatred for the law my <clears throat> disrespect for judges, my disrespect for the institutions of law that keep this country a representative uh, democracy, uh, the things that function based on trust in the system, uh, I don't have to listen to that. I don't have to uh, regard that as applying to me. I'm above the law. I'm better than you. I don't have to do anything that the Constitution requires me to do. I don't have to have a peaceful transfer of power if I don't want to because I'm Donald Trump. I, I, can, I can hate on this country as much as I want, and I can disrespect and disregard the rule of law if it, if it, if it makes me a big man, if it makes me better. That's who he is. That's what he does, right? And then if you use the Constitution, if you use the rules that are in the Constitution to make sure that we have a peaceful transfer of power, which we've always had, and we've had some really, really brutal elections in this country, okay? We've had elections where people got assassinated in the middle of them, okay? Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was assassinated in a kitchen in California right after he won the California primary. I mean, we've had some really, uh, you know, crazy things happen in this country, okay? We had Barry Goldwater lose, and he conceded his election. We've had Richard Nixon lose and then come back and run again, okay? We've had, uh, we had Bush v. Gore, where Al Gore conceded, OK, we had this la the 2016 where Hillary Hillary Clinton conceded to Donald Trump the next morning. After it was clear that Donald Trump had won the electoral votes in the Electoral College enough to become the president of the United States. I remember she wore a purple suit, it looked like she was, you know, in mourning. You know, purple and black is like their morning colors. And uh, but she went there and Bill Clinton stood next to her and she wished him luck. And she tried to tell her followers, remember the Pumas? It was something my ass, I'll just say that, okay? Party unity. Party unity, my ass. Pumas. Uh, and she told all of her supporters, including the Pumas, who were kind of radical. And uh, said to them all, listen, we lost. That's just what happened. And now we want to have a peaceful transfer of power. And we have to wish him well because he is going to be the president of the United States of America. He'll be the 45th president. And that is the way it is. That's how our country works. And she conceded. She conceded to Donald Trump. And they're still blaming her for doing what Donald Trump did. And that is violating the United States Constitution's provision for a peaceful transfer of power. Clearly, it says on January 6th, that the vice president shall preside over the opening of the box that contains the electoral college votes and count them. That's all it says he, he is allowed to do. He, he is to preside, he is to open the box, and he is to count what is in it. That's it. Donald Trump couldn't give two figs, flying or otherwise, about how the Constitution prescribes a person who lost the electoral college behaves. Couldn't care less. But they love him. They love him, even though he hates everything that makes America great, everything that makes America decent, everything that makes America good, like the Constitution and the rule of law. You know, those are kind of bedrock. You know, without those, you really got nothing. But anyway, so you, you have him, you have him 
actually saying that he doesn't want a speedy trial. He doesn't. He doesn't want to go to trial fast He because it's the only other thing he has. He has the victim card that he plays constantly, and, of course, he's the victim, even though he violated the law, even though he disregards the Constitution, even though he's the one who took the oath to protect and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, which should have included even me, even if it's me, even if it's my own damn self, okay? But now the second play he has that he always makes is to delay, 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 delay. In this delay, he sees that if he could, okay, the, the reason why he's on trial is because he was asking Mike Pence to delay the constitutionally mandated proceeding on January 6th where you count the electoral votes, which have already been certified in their states, have already been cast on December 14th. Everybody forgets about that day, right? When you first have an election in your state, if, if it's close or whatever, if it's like, what, a half a percentage point, automatic recounts kick in in some states. Other states, somebody has to request a recount. Other states, somebody has to request and pay for a recount, okay? But the states are in charge of their own elections. As you know, we have 50 different elections because we have 50 different states and 50 different rules. But everybody in the state lives by the rules of their state. And then the states actually count their own votes. They uh, either agree that, you know, they need an audit. They agree that they need a recount, whatever. That happens once everything is settled and once everything is adjudicated, everything is figured out, everything is recounted, everything is inspected, whatever. Then the secretary of state will recommend certification. Some, some secretaries can certify and then the governor of the state will certify the result of the election and send those results to Washington, D.C., right? On the 14th of December, those, that slate of electors that has been certified cast their votes for whoever they were pledged to that won, okay? So if it was the, the Hillary Clinton slate in your state that won, then Hillary's uh, slate of electors cast their vote for Hillary on December 14th. If it was the Trump slate, then they cast their vote for Trump on the 14th. The result of that is what then goes to D.C. for January 6th. That's how done it all is. It's been contested, adjudicated, certified, passed, sent, and all that's left is to certify the count. That's it. That's all this. Open the box. And, do, and just count. Count what was already done. Donald Trump wanted to not do that. Shit on TV. All things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. Okay, this is uh, Donald Trump's new lawyer. I hope he got paid in advance. President Trump wanted to get to the truth. He desperately wanted to get to what happened during the 2020 cycle. He did it in the courtroom. He did it in lobbying legislatures. That's all First Amendment. <laughs> and then at the end, he asked Mr. Pence to pause the voting for 10 days, allow the state legislatures to weigh in, and then they could make a determination to audit or re-audit or recertify. I mean, he says that, he says that admitting that Donald Trump was trying to obstruct a constitutionally prescribed a uh, uh, procedure in order for the peaceful transfer of power to continue on through uh, the month of November, December, January into uh, the 20th of January, where you have a ceremony at the White House uh, and you're sworn in as the new president replacing the old one. This he, guy he, is literally admitting that he did that, that he that he violated the constitutionally uh, prescribed uh, procedure. He says it as if it's a viable option for the president to take. Right, like it's a real thing to do, that you could ask the vice president to pause. First of all, Mike Pence doesn't have any authority to do anything other than preside. He has no authority to ask anybody to pause. He has no authority to order anything to pause. He has no authority to do anything on that day except stand there like the freaking mannequin that Mike Pence is and preside over the opening of a box and the recording of what's in it, the votes. That's it. That's all that happens on January 6th. Everything else has already happened. The only legal way 
that anybody in this country has to contest the results of any election. And I know I'm sitting here in Palm Beach County, and in 2020, there was a contested, a freaking unbelievably contested election having to do with not just Palm Beach County, it came down to us, but Broward County, Broward in Fort Lauderdale, uh, Dade County in Miami, all the, okay? And the only legal option that anybody has is called the contest period and the protest period. After an election, there are periods in time that allow for you to contest the results of an election in court. After you have exhausted all of the legal remedies in courts that are available to you, that's it. You're out of options. There is nothing left to do but be gracious and step aside. Donald Trump went to court 60 times, 60 and lost in every single court he went to. Produced zero evidence to back up any claims, which is why he kept losing, uh, because Rudy Giuliani was promising that he would have affidavits. I got affidavits. And that he was going to, uh, you know, uh, get the machines, and he was going to show that, you know, Nest uh, uh, thermostats were, were flipping votes uh, at the behest of China. Uh, crazy. And everybody said... This is really nutbag stuff. This is intense level 11 nutbaggery that we're watching here and listening to from the likes of the craziest people on the planet, the Sidney Powells, the Rudy Giuliani's with the with the makeup running down his face, the the boot black that he puts on his head. Do you know? I mean, it was just such a a sick freak show of, of of a clown car full of, you know, people that obviously had law degrees. Don't ask me how. But I've always told you some of the dumbest people I've ever met in my life have been lawyers. Also some of the smartest, but some of the dumbest. And everybody thinks if you have ESQ after your name or you have a law degree, a doctorate of jurisprudence, somehow you're brilliant. It, it's not like that. I've known car mechanics that are brilliant. I have. I've known aircraft mechanics that are absolute brilliant people who know physics and and all they are is mechanics. All they are. Uh, They are mechanics. They don't have a degree. But you got a problem that you can't, you want solved before you get in the air, that's your guy. Anyway, this is such crazy crap that he's, you know why, you know why uh, John Lauro is saying, yeah, well, you know, he just wanted to get to the truth. Not the truth truth. Not the, not the, the real truth. He wanted to get to the truth of his vision of how it should have ended, could have ended, would have ended. And it didn't, so he needs more time because that's what I'm talking about. That's what he does. He's the victim. The election was stolen from him, and he needs to delay the certification. That's all he knows. These are his two tricks. I'm the victim, and I need to delay. I'm the victim. I need to delay. And you know what? It works for him. It has worked for him. And this is why he continues with this two-trick pony, uh, you know, routine of his, because it has worked for him. Now, I also want you to keep in mind that he's a guy who settles. Now, I know that runs counterintuitive to some of the people in this audience who are MAGA, ultra-MAGA, Trumpy, Trumpian, uh, you know, QAnons, QAnon believers. It's all been, you know, uh, it's, it's all a deep state. Uh, it's a ruse, and he is a victim, and blah, blah, blah. I understand that. I I really, I get you. I I, I know that that's your thing. Um, But it it, it can't possibly work in a court of law. And so all he's doing is playing to you. That's it. He's trying to play to you to get you to do his dirty work yet again. But he clearly has lost. He will lose again. There is no way this country is in the mood for him. I'm just saying. I know that, you know, there's 23% of the, and there's a, this is a very important stat I'm about to tell you because this shows you how important you are. You. Do you know the percentage of Americans who vote in primaries? Does anybody have a clue like what, what arena that number might be in? Um, we all know it's below 50%, right? As Americans, we all agree we don't vote. But do you know how minuscule the amount of primary voters is relative to the population that's eligible to vote in this country? It's 23%. 23% will show up and vote in a primary. 23%. 
you're saying to the the, the ultra magas and the and, you know who who literally make up half of 25 percent of this country half of 25 percent that is who maga is okay and they will show up and vote and they will get their way if we don't you understand what i'm saying to you so that's why I'm, try, I'm trying to explain to you there are no off years anymore. There are no small elections. There's no, you know, oh, it's a local Mississippi gig, you know, and I don't have to show up for that. There's no, uh, oh, it's an Ohio issue on Tuesday and I don't have to show up for that because it's August. So, you know, and when I talk to that guy who, you know, obviously, you know, wants to believe that Trump loves America more than I do or whatever it is he was about to tell me, uh, but he got caught up in his own BS and just couldn't spew it. First thing I asked him is, are you going to vote on Tuesday? Nah, probably not. Okay, so they're not really informed about when these elections are. That's by design. But you are. You are. And if you show up on primary day and you show up on Tuesday in in, uh, Ohio, you'll be able to amend your constitution with 50% plus one, which is what it's been for 100 years. If you don't show up on Tuesday in Ohio... They will raise the threshold to get anything, uh, you know, on on the ballot to reform or to re- repair mistakes that, you know, are made in Ohio to 60 percent. Sorry that, that that's never going to happen. You're never going to get 60 percent of anybody agreeing on anything. Call in connect to speak to Randy. Call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. Yeah, he's making the rounds of the TV lawyer. This is uh, the John Loro guy that, uh, you know, uh, Trump hired. And, and he hires him to go on the TV is what it is. And to respond to things that Mike Pence said on the TV, right? It's all about the TV. That's what I'm trying to tell you. He's playing you. He's, he's literally playing the TV audience. He, so here's John Laurel again admitting that Donald Trump did what he's charged with doing under a statute that makes what he did illegal. So here he is on Fox now telling, uh, you know, I don't know what she put in her lips. I don't even know what's going on anymore with women and lips. Is, what is that? Is that, is that, is that, is it plastic? Is it, I, what is it? Silicone? Is it silicone? I have no idea, but I can honestly say for myself, and I'm not shaming anybody who feels they need to improve themselves, but I've never come across a woman where she didn't have that done, and then later on I noticed it was done, and I was like, man, that Duck made lips. all the difference. It now, has a name. Now I'm attracted. I've just, and I know Listen, it's a, she can't it's a even, personal choice. But. She can't close her mouth anymore. She cannot keep her mouth. Her, her, she asked for them to do it so that her lips would be parted. She thinks like it looks like a perfect uh, you know, powder. Sign. It, it's so unnatural and uncomfortable to like have to look at her lips. Okay. But what if you have nobody around you? And I, I know her. I mean, I know her, know her. Okay. I worked, we worked next door to each other. I, we went to, you know, like events and I would see her. She always had the best clothes. I, I will say she has the most expensive designer clothes. I'll never forget the Vivian Westwood dress. It was a, it was a, like a powder blue gown. It was the most gorgeous thing I ever saw in my life. And she was such a bitch. She is so nasty and so drunk. Laura Ingram is a white, white. You know, she makes Stephanie Miller look like a teetotaler. But Stephanie's a nice drunk, okay? She's fun. Laura's a bitch. She's nasty. But anyway, now she looks like uh, as fake as as her heart is. You know, she's as dark as her soul now. Anyway, here she, and, and you know, she's a lawyer. You know that. She went to like an Ivy League school, Dartmouth. And he's going to pitch her. Yes, Donald Trump did what he's charged with, and that's okay. (laughs) And she's going to go, right, uh uh-huh. What President Trump said is, let's go with option D. Let's just halt, let's just pause the voting and allow the state legislatures to take one last look and make a determination as to the as to whether or not the elections yeah. were handled fairly. That's constitutional law. That's not an issue of, of criminal activity. That is totally criminal. That's what he's charged with doing, because there is nothing in the Constitution that allows uh, anybody uh, to sidestep the constitutional procedure for counting the Electoral College ballots and slates of electors. There is nothing in the Constitution that says 
uh, ask the vice president to pause January 6th. That's called obstruction of an official proceeding. <laughs> I mean, it's so violative of what the Constitution lays out as the way that we make a peaceful transfer of power from one president to another when an election's been lost, contested, adjudicated, uh, audited, and then certified, sent to the next level. December 14th, the slates that were certified cast their ballots, sent to January 6th to the Congress. That's when you open the box and you count. That's it. He, and she's sitting there going, uh-huh, that's right. So what, was this was Plan D, he said? So what was Plan E? Use violence to stop it. I mean, is he going to go down that road? Is he actually going to open the door to that? Well, when Trump couldn't get his way and when the legislatures refused to budge off of the Constitution, the United States Constitution, which is supreme over their state constitutions, even though they executed their state constitutions brilliantly, effectively, with oversight from their courts, which is what, you know, this North Carolina case I just told you about, Moore v. Harper, was looking to take the courts out of the equation and let the legislatures just do what they wanted without any oversight from the court. That's what was just decided by the Supreme Court as, "Mm, that won't fly. But that's the independent legislature theory, okay? This is what they decided to do because what Trump did is illegal. Because you can't do anything once the courts have said there was no determinative, nothing that would uh, change the result of the election. No determinative fraud. Just doesn't exist. Didn't happen. Oh, well, this was Plan D. What? Did the con- Does our Constitution have a Plan B? Does it have, like, if you don't like uh, this clause, try that one. <laughs> And if you don't like, uh, you know, any of them and you don't like uh, Plan C or E, uh, violence. And that is what they were advocating inside the White House. That is the most terrifying portion of any of the testimony is that they said to each other. Greg Jacobs would go, you know, he was a a Pence's counsel and he would say there is nothing in the Constitution that's going to allow you to pause or put fake electors uh, uh, together or, you know, pretend that these were the duly certified. I don't know what you're thinking, but if you went to the Supreme Court with any of these arguments, you would lose nine to nothing. You remember that conversation? And that was Greg Jacobs talking to John Eastman, and he testifies to that, to the January 6th lawyers who had, you know, they had everybody deposed. And Greg Jacobs, uh, Mike Pence's uh, counsel, was deposed. And they asked him, what was the conversation with, uh, you know, Eastman? I mean, why did he think he had a plan D? And he said, I don't know. But I tried to explain to him that if you went to the Supreme Court with this plan D idea, with this crazy idea, they would vote you out of there nine to nothing. And Eastman said, well, maybe seven to two I would lose. And Greg Jacobs said, no, nine to nothing. And John Eastman agreed. Yeah, you're right. Nine to nothing, I would lose. And still, he's telling, according to Trump and Trump's lawyer, Donald Trump is relying on John Eastman's advice. (laughs) But John Eastman already tells everybody around him he knows that his advice is illegal and that he would lose in the Supreme Court nine to nothing. I swear to God. Here, here. Mr. Jacob, you discussed and even debated this theory at length with Dr. Eastman. Did Dr. Eastman ever tell you what he thought the U.S. Supreme Court would do if it had to decide this issue? Yes. Um, We had an extended discussion, an hour and a half to two hours on January 5th. Um, And when I pressed him uh, on the point, I said, John, If the vice president did what you were asking him to do, we would lose nine to nothing in the Supreme Court, wouldn't we? Um, And he initially started it, well, I think maybe you would lose only seven to two. Um, And after some further discussion, acknowledged, well, yeah, you're right, we would lose nine nothing. So maybe when you initially heard this testimony from Greg Jacobs, the counsel to Vice President Mike Pence, about the conversation he had with John Eastman, where John Eastman was saying, can't Mike Pence just pause? Can't he just say we we need to delay? And Greg Jacobs, the counsel for Mike Pence, tells him 
you would lose in the Supreme Court nine to nothing. He goes, well, maybe I'd lose seven to two, meaning he knew he would lose. And another hour goes by and he goes, no, you're right. I would lose nine to nothing. So they all knew that they were going to break the law. They all knew that they were going to advise Donald Trump that he was allowed to violate the Constitution. I don't think so. And this is his defense. Bye bye, dickhead. See you in Attica. This is the Randy Rhodes Show. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. When exactly did President Trump know that it would be illegal for Mike Pence to refuse to count electoral votes? Here is one sample of testimony given by one of the witnesses before us today, the Vice President's General Counsel. Did John Eastman ever admit, or as you know, in front of the president that his proposal would violate the Electoral Count Act? Uh, I believe he did on the 4th. That was January 4th, two days before the attack on Congress. (laughs) He knew, John Eastman knew that he was, he was, going to tell the president that the only thing that he could possibly try is to break the law. (laughs) That was it. That's where they were. And that if that didn't work, okay, if that didn't work, then, uh, you know, you could use violence. And sometimes, and this is what they were telling each other, sometimes, you know, you need a little insurrection. Sometimes you need a little violence. That's what John Eastman's position was. That's what Jeffrey Clark's position was. That's why we have an Insurrection Act, is what they were saying to Donald Trump. You know, if you stay and cling to power illegally, you know, in violation of the United States Constitution, which is what you'd be doing, okay, there will be riots in the street. But that's kind of why we have an Insurrection Act. So you could call it the military and put down the normal citizens that understand what you just did was be a dictator and upend and end, not upend, but just end democracy, just end the Constitution, just put a period at the end of the sentence and say, you're done. That's it. I'm staying. You don't like it. Here comes the military for you. I mean, this is what the Republicans used to be like in fear of their lives that Barack Obama was going to do. Remember, Barack Obama was going to declare martial law. He was always. And by the way, can I just say, if you think that uh, Donald Trump's uh, economy was swell, if you thought it was great, if you thought it was cool, if you thought it was good, that was Barack Obama's economy. Just saying. (laughs) Because Donald Trump didn't do anything. He didn't pass anything. Just a tax cut giving $2 $2 trillion unpaid for to the wealthiest Americans. That was it. That was it. The economy that Donald Trump inherited was Barack Obama's economy. And I, I bet you, you weren't okay with Barack Obama. <laughs> but he brought you an incredible amount of prosperity. Just saying. But, I mean, this is so sick that they knew and they were telling him the only option left for you is to stay in violation of the Constitution, is to stay in violation of law, rule of law, and then be willing to call out the military to put down any protesters who have anything to say about you becoming their first dictator. And he was like, well, uh, you know what I'm going to do? I don't want to have to call out the military because I don't think Millie will do it. I don't think Esper will do it. They've already told me. You know, when, when I tried to get Millie to clear out, uh, you know, Lafayette Square, remember that? Uh, he went and apologized. He went and apologized that he was with me that day because, you know, it got a little ugly. Because there was some, uh, you know, tear gas and we cleared the park of peaceful First Amendment loving protesters. Right. And Millie, remember, General Millie apologized for being there, which is why Donald Trump trashes Millie and says he's the worst general ever. That's why. That's why. But anyway, he didn't have faith that Millie would do it. And he didn't have faith that Mark Esper, the uh, secretary of defense, would do it. And so he thought, you know what we could do? John, and this is John Eastman, who was advocating the use of violence through the military. He said, John, you and Rudy Everybody go out to, uh, to go, go back to the park tomorrow. I want you to go out there and tell, Rudy actually said, that's what we're going to do. We're going to have trial by combat, trial by combat, right? And Eastman, he spoke at the uh, ellipse that day. He spoke at the rally. 
and they got them all worked up. And he said, you know what? Just weaponize them, deploy them. Because if these lunatics actually are willing to commit violence against their own capital, they're going to get caught, you know. And I mean, I'm not going to defend them. But let them try and delay it. Let them try and do it. And they did. They used the violence. And, and as it was happening, we were saying to you, this is going to turn violent if they realize that all their options are spent. Everything that they could try legally is done. They tried. They failed. It's now crunch time, okay? All we need to do is get through the certification on January 6th, and then we had to get through the inaugural. And we were like, you know, knowing something was not going to go smoothly because we knew he wasn't going to leave. But what he did was he used the crowd to be the military and attack his own capital. And they did it. They did it. And now there's been over a thousand cases. And there's probably a thousand more. Do you know that? Somebody uh, at DOJ, I think it was, uh, said that there were about 3,000 cases that still have to be uh, uh, adjudicated of uh, January 6th violent, uh, you know, uh, uh, violent doers, people who broke windows, people that crushed cops, people that stepped on people, people that bear sprayed, people that beat people, people that used, uh, you know, weapons, right? And Donald Trump disavows all of them, all of them, did absolutely nothing for them. And he's the ringleader, and you think somehow he should be not tried? You think somehow he should be left alone? Because why? Oh, because he has to run again if he wants to be president to shield himself from, uh, you know, uh, going to prison again? So, I mean, it, he's always going to be running if that's the case. Always. He'll run for anything. He'll run for dog catcher, whatever it is, and he'll say, oh, it's the middle of the election. It doesn't matter doesn't matter. But the presidency is exactly what Will Hurd, the Republican from Texas, who's running in the primary, said Donald Trump was using it for. And that is his get out of jail free card. He is not running for, to be president of the of the people of the United States. He's not even running to be president of the constitutional United States. He's not running to be the president of uh, this, the, the country that uses rule of law to govern itself. He's running to stay out of prison. Because he's going to prison. You all know that, right? He broke every law you could break as president of the United States. But while he was president, all you could do was impeach him. So he got impeached twice. He almost got removed for the January 6th debacle. Mitt Romney at least came to his senses and voted to remove him. This man was impeached twice. He's been indicted now for everything from espionage. Espionage. Think about that. An American president, the documents case, is under the Espionage Act to obstruction of Congress, to violating the constitutional peaceful transfer of power, to ripping you off of your right to vote. Deprivation of rights, that is a crime against you. It's your rights that, that have been deprived because he's depraved. That's what that charge represents. It represents you losing your free speech. And, and the way that we speak about how, you know, who we want to represent us is by voting. And he is literally stealing the votes of people who didn't vote for him. That's why he's charged with deprivation of rights. He's not charged with incitement or any speech violation at all, at all, nothing, nothing at all. Nobody wanted to litigate uh, whether or not you had the right to speak your way into a conspiracy or you had the right to incite violence against your own capital. Because, you know, the answer to that for sane, normal Americans is no. There is a line you cross when you start to commit uh, criminal conspiracies. There is a crime to be adjudicated. There's a crime uh, that has a penalty when it is that you uh, violate the Constitution. There's, there's a crime for obstructing an official proceeding of Congress, even if you spoke to people to get them to do it for you. Okay, But nobody's charging him with speech crimes. No one. No one, no one. They're charging him with depriving you of your rights. They're, depriving, they're, they're charging him with absolutely, positively obstructing a, an official proceeding of Congress. And that's a great one because that one has 20 years as its penalty. That's a big one.
So I just want everybody to be clear. Now, he's going to be in Alabama tonight speaking at a GOP dinner. Uh, I don't know if, you know, you're interested or, or not. But uh, and then <laughs> I know Howard will be. It's just what he does. It's just what he does. Uh, and then he's going to South Carolina, I think. Yeah, he's uh, he's on the campaign trail. Yeah, Columbia, South Carolina. He's campaigning, everybody. He's campaigning. For what? F- freedom? Freedom? The American way? What? <laughs> His freedom. Right. Good one. Happy birthday, Barack. Mr. President. Oh, and you know, Trump was pissed yesterday because the judge at the arraignment, the magistrate, called him Mr. Trump. Didn't call him Mr. President. Pissed him off. So happy birthday to Mr. President Barack Hussein Obama. <laughs>